So just to get started, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's training. Um, this is Tips for Working with Interpreters, a Best Practices Guide. We've had um, the opportunity to have this training be given by Claudia Asar. She's a court certified Spanish interpreter um, and she's got accreditation from the Administrative Office of U.S. Courts in the state of Washington. That's a big deal, as she'll let you know. A court certified interpreter is a very different animal from other type, types of interpreters. Um, she's been working and translating professionally since 1999, um, and she's been um, graciously willing to take some time out from her full-time translating work to help us out here today. Um, this training, the purpose of this training is to help um, our partnership between QLaw and Entre Hermanos. Entre Hermanos, of course, serves Latino LGBTQ folks, um, primarily um, monolingual Spanish speakers, although we do certainly help those who are lucky enough to be bilingual or trilingual. And um, QLaw, of course, which offers free legal clinics. Um, the idea behind this partnership was to help QLaw um, to serve a wider variety of our queered community in these clinics. And um, in order to do that with Entre Hermanos clients, that means being able to work with Spanish speakers. So if you're bilingual, great. If you're not bilingual, uh, you'll probably end up using an interpreter at some point. And even if you are bilingual, people speak a whole lot of languages. So you'll get some good use out of this training either way. Um, Claudia, we are so excited to have you. Um, it's now 12.02, so uh, without further ado, uh, we're really excited to get started. Let's, let's Thank go you, ahead. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, yes, my name is Claudia Zar, and I'm a Spanish interpreter. And my hope today is to give you a little glimpse of what my work is all about and how we, the interpret profession, can help you in the legal system. Um, first of all, you know that we're all using Zoom. Um, most of you will be muted. And Denise and Kelsey will be able to monitor the chat or the question and answer box. If you have any comments or questions, you're welcome to write them down. You can also raise your hand. We will have a, a portion of the presentation at the end open for questions and answers. So um, if we put them all at the end, maybe we'll have time to answer them all. Anyway, um, Denise and Kelsey are very knowledgeable about these topics, so they will be chiming in uh, throughout the presentation. So any comments, please feel free to add them, and I will be happy. If I don't have the answer, I'll look for it, and I will send it to you at the end. And if I have any information that I can help, I'll be delighted to share it. Um, today, we're going to talk about what is an interpreter? And then the difference between translation and interpretation, because that is a very common mistake. The different types of interpreters, like Kelsey just said, there are different types. The modes of interpretation, how we work with interpreters, and what to expect. So the first thing is talking about the number one difference, which is what makes an interpreter an interpreter. We we just heard Kelsey talk about being bilingual. A lot of us are. I, for one, was born and raised in Mexico, and my parents felt since I was little that learning English, English was going to be very important for me and my sisters. So I started learning English in kindergarten. All the way through college, I went to bilingual institutions. However, you will hear that I have an accent because my A language is Spanish born and raised in Mexico for 25 years, I feel more comfortable speaking in Spanish. My English, despite the fact that I'm married to an American guy who doesn't speak Spanish and I have to practice it all the time, you will hear that I have an accent. So that's my B language. There are people who have A languages bilingual and they are amazing and you hear them in another language and you think they're native speakers and you hear them in the other language and you're like in awe that they speak both languages beautiful. I don't have a double A. However, some of these people are not interpreters. So being bilingual alone doesn't make you an interpreter. There are other little things that need to be added to the pie. And we'll go to it in a minute. 
Another difference that I want you to understand, there's one type of work which is translation and another type of work which is interpretation. Translators are the people who have the luxury to sit in front of a computer, have tons of dictionaries, and they have time to make these beautiful translations in writing. They're working with the written language. They often have a long time to be able to prepare anything they're working on. Interpreters, on the other hand, are people who are working with a spoken language. And we are working in the field everywhere. Um, we were lucky we have our laptop with us, but we don't have the luxury to bring our library with us. And so we are working with what we have, with our knowledge, and we are using our words, our spoken language. So that's the difference. Second difference that I've been telling you about. Now, just like with the doctors, when someone tells you they're a doctor, I think that our immediate question is, well, what type of doctor are you? Are you a dentist? Are you a family doctor? Are you a naturopath? Whatever. It's the same thing with interpreters. If I come to you and I tell you that I'm an interpreter, I could be many things. I'm showing you here some of the interpreters that you will find in the area where you work in the state of Washington. The medical and social interpreters are certified by DSHS. Um, just like their name states, they usually work in hospitals, clinics, they, they are community liaisons. They have to have present a test and they get a credential and they have to continue their education and they have to work so many hours to keep their credential. They are a different thing than a conference interpreter. Conference interpreters are the interpreters who work in the companies around the area. Boeing will hire them, Amazon, Microsoft, Starbucks. They will go to the convention center and work with people who come from all over the world for a meeting. And then we have the judicial interpreters. Oh, and of course there are others like the, they used to be called escort interpreters, but it became politically incorrect, so now we call them elbow interpreters, which is, for example, being hired to go to the wineries in Woodenville with a group of people to taste wine all day and interpret for them. Those are fun jobs too. That's another type of interpreter. But we're going to concentrate today in the judicial interpreters. There are differences for the judicial interpreters as well. Where do we, you see us? You see us in court every day. We're doing all types of hearings in court. We're also doing uh, mit uh, mitigations, we're doing arbitrations, we're doing depositions, we go to jails, we go everywhere. We go to the legal clinics, we go to the detention centers. Now, interpreters are certified by the state or the federal government. Well, not all of them, I correct myself. The federal government has a certification for interpreters, but only in three languages. Spanish, Haitian Creole, and Navajo. So if the federal government needs any other languages that are not those three, they need to accept interpreters that are state certified. State certified interpreters are certified by their own state, and there, are, there is some reciprocity between states so they can practice in different states, whereas federal interpreters can practice in all 50 states. So what else makes us different than the rest of the interpreters? Well, court interpreters have to be tested. They have to pass a written test, and only if they pass the written test, they can go to the oral test. So you have an idea. There are about 137 Spanish court certified interpreters in the state of Washington. The mass majority are located in the King County, Snohomish and Pierce area. And there are only 14 federal Spanish interpreters in the state of Washington, both in the Eastern District and the Western District of Washington. 
Um, in fact, we're very few in the Pacific Northwest. So most of the federal interpreters have to, or used to have to travel to Alaska, Montana, Idaho, etc. So these tests are very difficult, I would say, because they require deep knowledge, not only of the words and the world, but also for us to be able to have a wealth of vocabulary. There is something that we call having a very, very deep register. The register of the language is being able to have vocabulary that allows us to communicate with a person who might have a, a level of education of second grade, to be able to interpret for someone who has a um, medicine degree. And we have to be able to have this breadth of information to be able to immediately, when we're working, be able to work with words. So our register is very important. We convey meaning. We don't interpret word for word. For example, I'm going to give you a quick example. If I hear someone saying, don't pull my hair, or you're pulling my hair, if I were to interpret exactly that into Spanish, I would be saying, don't pull my leg. But if I interpret don't pull my hair into English, what, did, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything because it doesn't, word for word doesn't work. So don't pull my leg in Spanish would be don't pull my hair. So we have to convey the meaning of many things. So it's not that we have to interpret word for word. We have to interpret the meaning and idea. So there's a difference between the court interpreters and the medical interpreters that you're going to notice if you're working with volunteer interpreters at the clinic. Medical interpreters have a different code of ethics than the court. Their code of ethics asks them, asks them to be a little bit more like cultural brokers. So if they're in a medical situation, they can actually give some glimpse of the cultural background to be able to explain the medical staff what's going on. Court interpreters are not allowed to do that. Um, so this is very important for you to know because when you are working with interpreters, you're going to have to have your little antenna up and see and look for certain things depending on what you are doing. Um, so interpreters are not advocates. We cannot help you. We cannot be consultants. We cannot give you an opinion of the person you're working with. We cannot help you. We cannot give you additional information. We cannot translate. We cannot be the personal secretary. We are just going to be there to allow you to be able to speak with the non-English speaking person as an elevate the LEP as if they were just like any other English speaking person. That is very important. And I want you to know that we have a, a code of ethics. We are officers of the court. We're ruled by the general rule 11.2. And this part is very important, especially uh, when we're working with the immigration population and the LGBTQ community because we as interpreters are part of the attorney-client team. We are covered by the confidentiality. We have to be accurate, complete. We cannot add, omit, or embellish anything in the communication. We have to be impartial. And if there's any conflict of interest, we have to say it right there and there. We cannot give legal, legal advice. And we also have to um, do seven, 16 hours every two years of continuous education. So it is very important that you know that when you're working with a court certified interpreter, the person that you're going to be working with should know that we're covered by that confidentiality. 
as interpreters, we need to have a lot of context before we go and work with someone. Because the more we know, the more prepared we are. We will know the terminology, we will be able to be prepared. So if an interpreter feels uncomfortable working with a particular community, immigration community, LGBTQ community, whatever, they will let you know right away. We are not there to judge. We are there to facilitate the communication. And we as independent contractors are allowed to just say no to a particular job because we don't feel comfortable with it. So do not feel, um, don't, don't think that it will be like an interpreter just coming into a situation not knowing what they're going to do. It is our responsibility to find out what we're doing. So if you see that interpreter is not comfortable with the topic or with a person that they're going to be working with, it is very important that you are aware of that before the meeting so it doesn't create any difficult situation when the client arrives. Now, here again, again this is super important. You have to give the interpreter context. Um, we sometimes are not part of a particular community. Um, sometimes we are um, seen as the enemy. I remember one time going to a proffer in federal court and the man was going to explain his participation with the Sinaloa cartel. And the moment I walked in, I knew what I was getting into. The moment I walked in, the man said, I don't want a Mexican interpreter. I want one of those white interpreters who speak Spanish because this Mexican interpreter might be part of the cartel. I don't want her here. All the attorneys turn around looking at me like, we're, we're sorry, you know, you have been rejected. Uh, I was taken aback, but as an interpreter, I didn't say anything. I said, I will be delighted to leave, no problem. That's fine. <laughs> you turn around and you leave. So it is very important to listen to the person who is going to be working with the interpreter, because if they don't feel comfortable, even if you have the best interpreter in the world, it's not going to work because you want your client to feel at ease, to feel comfortable, to feel that they can talk about anything. Especially, for example, in our cultures, uh, the Latino community, families are very concerned about LGBTQ issues. Um, people don't want to talk about the fact that they don't have papers, anything like that. They need to know that your interpreter is part of the team and that that interpreter, by law and because of her profession, will not divulge anything that has been mentioned in the meeting. That is very important. So when an interpreter is telling you what is the case about, where are the parties, when did it happen, how did it happen, what's going on, what's the issue at hand, don't think that the interpreter is just being nosy. We're not going to go and divulge things. But if we're going to be talking about a particular thing, a particular topic, then we can go and do our research. So when the time comes and we communicate, we have the terminology. We know what happened. So please don't think that we are going to take some of that information away. So going back to what we do, we have three modes of interpretation. The tests actually are prepared so we can do this when we do the oral test. There's three modes, the simultaneous, the consecutive, and the side translation. If you're going to be working with your clients in a legal clinic, most likely you're going to use consecutive mode and side translation. So let's dive in. The ASTM has defined the three modes of interpretation. I don't need to read it. You have it for future reference. But I would like to dive in a little bit more deeply in each of them. The side translation mode is the one, like I, I write here, the least flashy of them all. Um, it is what we call the hybrid mode of interpretation. You receive a piece of paper, anything. It could be a letter written by the victim, the perpetrator. It could be a, a guilty plea. Whatever document that needs to be read to the LEP. So it's hybrid because we are reading a document and we are 
interpreting orally. That's why it's called sight translation. Um, the most important thing that you have to know about the interpreter mechanics of this is that when we are given a piece of paper and we're told, hey, can you please read this to my client? We cannot just start interpreting because we need context. We need to know what we're reading. So like if we were in court, we would say, your honor, the interpreter needs a minute to review the document. So the first thing we do is that we review the document. We check if there are words that we have no clue, we can clarify, we can do whatever we need to do. And when we're ready, um, it's what I call throwing myself into the pool. I already checked what was in the pool. There were sharks, there were issues. I fixed them all. Now I, now I can go in and swim. So no false starts, no hesitations. I start reading the document as if it were written in the source language. Sorry, the target language. So these type of documents uh, can be very small or sometimes they can be very long. Sometimes if they have a lot of legal ease, my responsibility is not to water them down. So it is important that you know, that you find out what is the level of education of your client. Because if we're reading um, an opinion, a legal opinion, or if we're reading a guilty plea and there are words that people don't know what they are, even in English, then you, as the attorney, you're the ones responsible to make sure that your client understands, not the interpreter. Because according to our guidelines, if the LEP doesn't say I did not understand, we got to assume that they did. Because if an English speaker were to listen to those words and they don't say, I don't know what a guilty plea means, then we all assume that they do. Same in English. So you have to be very aware of that. Again, with the cultural issues, many people will say, I understand, because they don't want to look dumb or they don't want to disrespect people and taking their time and they will say yes I understand but I don't so it is very important that you guys keep an eye on the person while the interpreter is doing the site translation because you don't know if they are going to understand and the interpreter will not tell you oh you know I think that they're not understanding what should we do because we're just not allowed to do that now the simultaneous Interpretation is like the coolest one because it looks super fancy and uh, it's very difficult to learn. It's kind of like riding a bike, but once you learn it, it's the easiest one and it's very it's fun. Um, we are usually interpreting at the same time the speaker is speaking, but with a small um, lag of time, which is uh, has a very fancy name, which is the collage. So we wait for an idea to be uttered, and then we are just following the speaker. Um, this is the type of interpretation used when the, the LEP is a passive listener. For example, in trial, they don't need to speak directly to anybody, but they have to listen to the entire procedure. Then they have a team of interpreters switching every 15 or 20 minutes, listening to the entire thing. If you're in a clinic, for example, and your super advisor comes in the room, my responsibility as an interpreter is to continue to interpret everything that's been said. So if you are communicating with your supervisor and you're explaining the situation, your interpreter should turn around and immediately, simultaneously, interpret what's been said. And then when you guys have a question for him or her, you can turn around and then we would use the following mode. So for simultaneous mode, um, usually if we speak, speak, people speak too fast, we can slow them down. And we have to avoid the over, overlapping voices because it is very difficult to be able to choose. I mean, you cannot do the work if people are speaking on top of each other. In this type of uh, mode, we usually have um, devices, a little radio, microphone, transmitter, receiver, so we don't have to be right next to the person all the time and we can move around as interpreters and be closer to the speakers so we can hear. Now, the consecutive mode is the one that you're probably the most um, familiar with if you have been doing a lot of work with interpreters in the past, or if you're not, this is the one that you're going to use the most. Because in a consecutive mode, 
the LEP needs to participate. They need to answer questions, they need to ask questions, they need to speak. So in the consecutive mode, the interpreter will listen to an idea or a question, wait for the speaker to stop, then he or she will interpret, and then wait for the answer or the question, and then interpret again. So, like uh, the slide tells us, we can use this on the stand, uh, client attorney interviews, uh, phone conferences, we do it a lot, and the interpreter goes back and forth. So number one, it is very important that you know that in general, this type of meetings take longer than if you were meeting with an English speaker, because now you have that extra space where you have to wait for the interpreter to interpret. And again, preparation is very important, and it is kind of telltale, and we're going to be talking about some red flags in a minute. When we don't see an interpreter with a piece of paper and a pencil, a notebook and a pencil, that's kind of scary, because we have to take notes, because we're using our short-term memory. We are also going to get information such as date of birth, addresses, phone numbers, uh, things like that. So the interpreter needs to be prepared and you need to give her the time to, to prepare with that. So I was talking about red flags. When you're talking to, with your interpreter, there can be uh, what we call a little bit of a pre-session where you will let your interpreter know what the topic is about, what you're going to be discussing in general with your client. And when you are meeting with your client, and I think this is the most important part, that you really need to make sure that your client feels comfortable. And if you see things, for example, that there's a lot of silence or a lot of dialogue between them, blah, 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 and then the interpretation is, yes or no and you're like well but i heard you speaking for a long time what happened red flag another red flag is when the interpreter will answer for your client there's something weird there another one is for example if you notice that your interpreter is kind of confused or frustrated or there's something not quite there or um, the answers don't make sense to your question. Of course, there are sometimes issues that have to do with mental health, but if the answers don't match, red flag. Um, if your interpreter is repeatedly asking for clarification, red flag. Or the client corrects the interpreter, red flag. Or the client telling the interpreter that, like, well, maybe my interpreter needs a break, Red flag. So you have to trust your instinct because there has to be a flow of communication. And again, sometimes you will not be working with court interpreters and they're not going to be sophisticated enough to know all these little rules. So you really have to, besides all the things that you're going to be doing, helping the person and dealing with all these issues, you're going to have to keep an eye on your interpreter. If you're doing phone interpretation, it could be that you're working with um, interpreters kind of like language line, interpreters that are used to interpret in emergency situations like 911. And in emergency situations, interpreters are allowed to ask questions, clarify, double check, um, cut, paste, do everything they want because there is an emergency situation and the 911 operator needs the information as soon as possible. So sometimes when they're working on the phone, doing this type of um, interviews, they forget that they are not in an emergency mode and they try to do that type of work here. And you have to stop them and remind them that this is a client attorney interview and they have to interpret everything um, and they cannot interject. Same thing with medical interpreters. If they start giving you their opinion about 
um, the witchcraft or the issues of in, in, in my home country, we don't allow LGBT people, whatever, we, you stop them right on their tracks and remind them that this is a legal client attorney interview and they're there to communicate and interpret for the LEP. So I am going to stop here for questions and answer. I hope that um, you have asked some questions. I have not been able to see the chat. I want to add in the presentations that you will receive, I have some resources at the end. For example, questions to consider when your interpreter is not certified. Um, what to do when you work with your interpreters, common sense things like using the first person, interpreter will always use the third. Um, not to use slang or play on words, etc. And then the do's and don'ts that are very useful because sometimes we, um, there's just things that are logical and they make a lot of sense, but we don't think about them. So I decided that instead of reading them out loud for you, I wanted you to have them so you can take a peek at them whenever you need it. So that's pretty much it. So I would like to open the forum for questions or if Kelsey and Denise have anything to add, please, you're welcome. It looks like we have a raised hand from uh, Constance. Uh, Constance, do you want to go ahead with your question? Sorry, um, that's my fault. This is Denise. Um, I had to unmute Constance um, uh, and I did not do that. So Constance, go ahead. You should be unmuted. Um, go ahead and, and ask your question. I was, um, I am had a question about your list of red flags because I didn't get them all, all down and if they are anywhere. Um, additionally, um, I had, I was working with an interpreter and a lot of these red flags were coming up and I didn't realize they were red flags and I kept trying to work with the interpreter and eventually discovered that I just had to get a different interpreter. So I was wondering how long do you recommend trying to work with an interpreter or does it just depend on how bad the red flags are? That's a great question. I think that it is always, a, in this pre-session, it would be great for you to find out what type of interpreter you have if you don't know them, especially if you get them by phone. Because then you will know how to tailor your interview or tell them beforehand what you need and what you don't need. Um, I think that if you realize that your interpreter is not court certified at any of the levels that I talked about, then you should probably ask them their experience. And if it doesn't work, I think the sooner, the, the sooner you stop, the better. Because not only are you wasting your time, but you're also wasting the client's time and they are going to lose trust in this system where they feel that the interpreters won't, will never be able to express what they need to express because they're not doing a good job and nobody notices. So the sooner the better, I guess, I would say. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, my pleasure. And Constance, to answer your question about where the do's and don'ts are, there is a link in the chat to the PDF um, of Claudia's presentation. Um, and so um, if you're not able to access that link, I will, um, it was in the reminder email for the webinar as well. Okay, um, I did get the link and I did, I do have it. Great, okay, yeah. so you should have all of that. Um, and then I think Kelsey is gonna field Daryl's question and then we have two questions in the Q&A from Aline and Mari that we'll, we'll do next. But folks, if you do have questions, feel free. Can, can I add one backup question? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, my other question was, uh, in the pre-session, when I'm with the interpreter, can I ask them for some cultural background information? Uh, that is a slippery slope. 
we are not supposed to I mean, for example, if you ask me where I come from, let's say that you have a client that comes from the state of Oaxaca, Mexico, and you want to know if I come from a particular region that hates the South region and they will never be able to communicate very well, absolutely. If it has to do with my language. But if it is like, well, what do you think about the people from Oaxaca and how do they deal with these issues? I'm becoming a cultural broker and that's not acceptable and I can't do it, even if I know the answer. But I can refer you to someone who knows and I can tell you that uh, there are experts who would be able to do that. Because we run the risk as interpreters to become expert witnesses and that's the worst thing that can happen to us. Okay, okay, because the question I was wondering about was how soon client, uh, how soon English was introduced into the client's educational system in a particular country? You can ask them, client, anything you want. Okay. So, uh, for example, there is one situation where I can notice that there's an accent. For example, I'm, I'm speaking with the, the LEP and I feel that their Spanish is not their first language. So my responsibility is to say to the attorney, the interpreter does not believe that uh, your client has Spanish as his or her first language. Could you please um, ask him? And then it's up to you to ask the person, where did you learn Spanish? Did you speak another language at home? When did you learn English? You can ask your client everything. Okay. Because we don't, we don't know the person. Okay, that, if we that knew would the work. person, we would not be able to interpret for them. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Yeah, that would work. Thank you. Perfect. And um, <clears throat> I believe the next person who has a question is Daryl. Um, Daryl, I'm trying to see if I see your question in anywhere, but um, let me see if we can unmute you. Looks like you're unmuted. Go ahead. Hello, Daryl? Um, we are not hearing you, Daryl. Um, Daryl, why don't you type your question into the chat and we'll come back to you. Um, and um, in the meantime, while Daryl's doing that, um, Aline um, has a question. When red flags come up and raise your concerns, but the issues continue, where do you go from there? Well, then you should stop your appointment and reschedule until you have the right interpreter. Um, there are some interpreters who, like in any profession, I'm sure that there are some attorneys who believe that they know every single type of law under the sun and they can do no, no wrong, and then people start to realize that they're not that great. Same thing with interpreters. If you see that the issues are not corrected, then just ask for someone else. Again, the no, uh, number one is your client. Awesome, thank you. Claudia, do you have recommendations for how you might communicate that in the moment to the client? I mean, I imagine that would be a difficult experience, particularly when folks are coming to legal clinics or are in, um, you know, receiving services that they really desperately need and then you have to pause because of the interpreter. Um, do you have best practices for that? Well, number one, um, again, you are, you have to be like a hawk with your clients <laughs> to see if they really are understanding and they are answering. Um, the best practice is to, at the beginning, tell the client, I'm here with an interpreter. Sometimes, uh, you know, for example, I've worked in legal clinics for years, so the attorneys know me, and they will just go directly to the clients and say, we're here with an interpreter. If you need anything, everything will be remain, remaining confidential. If you have any issues, let me know. Sometimes I work with, with attorneys who have never worked with an interpreter, and I will ask, the attorney that I need to uh, speak with their client to make sure that they can understand me. So I will uh, introduce myself briefly and say, 
Hello, my name is Claudia. I'm going to be your interpreter. Everything you say will be interpreted. You cannot uh, tell me something because that you don't want to share because I will have to share it. And if you don't understand me, let me know. But if there's no pre-session, that is something that you can tell your client when the three of you are sitting down. This is Claudia. She's your interpreter. She's here to interpret everything you say to me. If you don't understand her, um, she will not get upset if you complain about it. Just let us know because the most important thing is you and we want to make sure that you're comfortable and that we understand each other. And that way, if something happens, the, the LEP knows that they can speak up and the interpreter also knows that you're going to be paying attention to what they're doing in case they have different habits. Thank you, Claudia. That's really helpful. Um, our next question is from Mari. Um, she says, thanks so much for all this info and experiences. I am wondering what are some questions to ask Spanish interpreters to make sure they're comfortable and competent in working with LGBTQ plus communities? Great question, Mari. Thank you. Yes, excellent. Um, it, I always equate this with, with the immigration population. I think that um, if you give the interpreter context of what they're going to get into. For example, um, all the time when you call, if it's a new assignment, you will ask, who am I working with? What is the topic? What type of paperwork do you have? The more context you give the interpreter, the more uh, possibility for the interpreter to walk away if they don't feel comfortable or they don't like something. So if we have, uh, we have interpreters who have been rape victims and they will not touch any cases that have to do with rape. Um, I personally have never been tortured, but I freak out about it. So I don't like to take cases where people have been tortured. So if you let the interpreter know at the beginning, you're going to be working with people who are undocumented. Is that going to make you feel uncomfortable? Or you're going to be talking with a transgender person or whatever it is, you, you're giving them the opportunity to walk away at that moment. But the moment we are in, we're officers of the court and we are there, we're neutral and we cannot judge or make anybody feel uncomfortable and we just have to go and do our job. So maybe just let them know what they're going to be doing and then that's up to them to accept the assignment or not. Thanks, Claudia, that's really helpful. Um, so we have a question. Um, Callan and Ashley both asked um, really similar questions. So I'm gonna put, moosh those into one. Um, and they are asking, um, Claudia, in your experience, um, what are some of the top things you see attorneys do poorly or top sort of top three mistakes you might see attorneys make when using um, interpreters and, and how, can, how can attorneys improve on that? Well, I think that number one is when they, and maybe they don't do it on purpose, but they show this frustration because their client doesn't speak English. Like it is a hassle to deal with the interpreter and now I have my client and it transpires. And you remember that 60% of our communication is body language. And you can tell immediately when an attorney, and they might be awesome attorneys, but they have an interpreter. There is that extra time that they're gonna to have to deal with to find an interpreter, schedule an interpreter, deal with an interpreter, and it transpires. And your client is number one, you're gonna do everything for them. And they can tell, sometimes they can tell when the, inter the attorney is frustrated because of the interpreter, because we're a necessary evil. So I know that we are expensive and we take time and we do all these things, but your client has the right to have one. So the client should not feel that. That's one of the things that I notice. The other one is, for example, um, the attorney getting immersed in their paperwork while the interpreter is doing consecutive or doing side translation. So the conversation becomes disjointed because the interpreter will interpret the question, the person answers maybe, for example, I have a very long consecutive, so I allow the person to tell um, a long story because I, I 
personally feel that if I'm interrupting the person every two seconds, then they're not going to be able to speak freely. So I try to hold as much as I can. And so during those times where the attorney is waiting, they get bored or they decide to multitask. And so it's very difficult for them to come back when the answer is coming because they just were somewhere else in their mind. So, um, and the third one, which is just people who are new and they forget um, the famous, tell her that I am her attorney. Tell her that I think that, or uh, explain this to her. That doesn't work. Always speak directly to your clients because we're just there to facilitate the communication. We're not part of the conversation. Those are the three things that I noticed mainly. Thanks for that, Claudia. It seems like one, one sort of golden rule um, that, that we can take from this is that, you know, when we're doing um, legal work or social services work, because I know not everybody on the call is, um, is a lawyer necessarily, but we're all serving communities in really wonderful ways. Um, it seems like really keeping the person first approach would be a best practice. Um, especially in the context of interpretation that you really are our additional job, our additional responsibility is to create that body language bond and the eye contact bond and those sort of non nonverbal relationship building skills um, are, would you say that those become particularly more important when you're working with an interpreter so that you can kind of overcome the awkwardness of the back and forth? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then also, if the interpreter keeps to herself, and here I am speaking in the third language because I'm used to it, but if I keep to myself and I don't participate and partake with people and I keep my notes, I keep my eyes down towards my notes, that will naturally, because we are human beings and we like to be in contact with others, the eyes of the LEP will go directly to the person who they communicate, even if they're not using the same language. So you don't want an interpreter who is like the prima donna in the party trying to, you know, we, we, tr we try the way we dress, the way we behave, we try to be in the room, but away so the two of you can create that bond. That is very important. So I noticed that um, Mari asked a question about um, what would be the best way to ask interpreters about their knowledge with specific language? So, you know, context is obviously kind of the golden standard here to give the person context beforehand, but we don't always know beforehand what it is that we're going to be talking about. So suppose someone comes to us and they've told us, yeah, I'd like a consultation about, um, you know, getting dealing with an eviction situation and then over the course of the conversation it might come out that the person has you know is being evicted basically because of transphobia or something um because all of our clients are queer um you know what would be some some appropriate gentle ways to ask people about their experience with lgbt vocabulary that's just fine. If you're asking the interpreter if they have LGBT vocabulary, that's fine. Because our responsibility is to prepare before we go. For example, if I'm going to do a, if I'm going to work with a domestic violence clinic, I know that I'm going to have to look for terminology that has to do with protection orders and uh, uh, the perpetrator or things like that. So if you say, we work in this clinic, this is the common denominator, they might be coming with issues of um, transitional housing or homelessness or sexual assault or whatever it is, but they are all queer or whatever, then it is my responsibility to prepare and know that this could be the type of terminology that I will be using. Okay. And what's a good way to clarify, because um, one of the beautiful things about language, and especially our queer community uses language in such wonderful ways, like a lot can be said with nuance. So if we think that something may not have been translated necessarily the way it was meant, what's a good way to interject with that? 
Well, you just interject. Um, we have a, a series of um, situations where we have to remind people that we're not walking dictionaries and we are not uh, machines and we make mistakes. And so the interpreter could stop the procedure and ask for clarification, or she can stand corrected. If the person, for example, Kelsey, if you have a client and you're bilingual and you see that the interpretation didn't work the way you want it, um, the interpreter can stand corrected any time because we are not perfect we can make mistakes, but it is our responsibility to clarify things and, um, and understand the, the people that we're going to be working with before we can um, accept an assignment. And of course we work, we learn on the job and all these things, but we need to understand the culture behind it. And that's why many times, for example, people will say we want a Mexican interpreter because I want my client to feel comfortable because um, they would not understand uh, another interpreter from another country, whatever, whatever your client wants, that's the most important thing. And if we don't know the terminology, sometimes, for example, you guys could give us a glossary. We have situations where a particular agency will say, hey, I work in this agency, this is our glossary. I'm sending you our terminology for translations and for interpretation, which is great because then we just add to what they already use. Thanks, Claudia. Um, one, um, one question that Callan had in the Q&A is, um, is sort of a, a more, specific, um, more specific question of what you're talking about here, which is particularly if a client is testifying um, and, and, and is using slang, is there a way, um, if, if we can tell that the interpreter is not interpreting the slang in the way that the witness means it, is there a way to ask for alternative meanings of the phrase that the witness is using? And, and in your experience, since you have many years of experience doing this, um, is there a, are, are there some ways that, like some, some questions that you've seen be successful and some questions that you've seen be unsuccessful? Well, the attorneys in court, they can voir dire the interpreter two ways from Tuesday. If they feel that we're not doing the job correctly, that's fine. Um, the judge, however, will have more, will give more credibility to another interpreter. And so, for example, when we're in court and an interpreter doesn't know or doesn't have a handle of the slang or the comment that was said or it was interpreted wrong, then our responsibility is to stand up and say, Your Honor, this interpreter needs to confer with her colleague and then trying to figure it out. If there's only one interpreter in the room and you feel that there was no uh, the meaning was not conveyed, then you can always ask more questions to elaborate. Or um, that's what has happened to me in the past. The interpreters who were bilingual, uh, attorneys who were bilingual who challenged something I said, and then that we would have a um, sidebar with the judge and the attorney would say, well, my client didn't say this, he said this particular thing. And then at that point, I would say, nope, I stand, I, I stand by what I interpret. I'm sorry, attorney, I don't believe that's the case. And I am the expert. Or I stand corrected, and then we move on, and I just make the corrections from the record. But you should not stay, remain quiet. If it's not working, you should say something about it. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Talia in the chat. Um, she says, hello, I'm a Spanish speaker. I'm an America member and served at two different host sites, interpreting and translating for the Hispanic community. I found it's hard sometimes to interpret when the English speaker expects a short answer and the client I'm helping expands the answer on a really long story. And I have to say everything that they're saying. Um, so if the, if the interpreter has to say everything that they're saying, how do you explain to someone to keep it short? Well, um, I, when I teach interpreting, I always tell my students to remember that the interpreter drives the bus because if we're not there, nothing can happen. So um, 
you if you are in a situation where the, the attorney needs a quick answer, and we're not talking about 911 interpreters where they really need a quick answer, um, you can just remind the person you're interpreting for that you have received so much information and it is your duty to interpret it. So they're just going to have to wait. And if they want to have shorter answers, then they have to let the LEP know that they need to answer. Uh, it, it's a yes or no answer, or please answer shortly. I just need to know certain things. Uh, because that's part of the cultural issue that, um, especially I remember when I came here 25 years ago, I used to explain things and I would go on and on and on and on and on until I would get to my point. And then after so many years here, I learned that I had to answer yes or no really quick. And so that's part of the culture. And people need to understand that some people need to say a lot of things before they answer. And we have to be aware of that and allow them to. You know, nobody wakes up in the morning saying, I want to go to court or I need to, an attorney. So sometimes finally they got their day where they can speak to someone and they want to say everything they want. And it'd be nice if we could listen to them and allow the interpreter to interpret that. Thank you. Um, so Aline has, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna do the same thing you were. Go ahead, Kelsey. Aline has a question. Can you give examples of what to do when there's not an option to get another interpreter? And I'll expand on this. So for example, suppose I'm in a, you know, eight o'clock meeting, 8 p.m. at the clinic or seven or something. And, you know, it's night and, and the, it, it becomes clear for whatever reason that it's not working with the interpreter. Um, but I still have to communicate that to the client. So can you walk us through what that might look like? Well, um, if you have no choice, I would make it very, um, very, first of all, you don't have to worry about hurting the feelings of the interpreter. We're professionals and we should have thick skin. So you could just say, you know, Mr. So-and-so, our communication is not working the way um, it should be. This is a very important case for you. So I would say it in short sentences that we're going to try to make sure that you come back next time. We will have a person who will be able to interpret for you and understand. We're very inter interested in your case. We are, are, you know, your situation is the most important thing for us right now, and we will make sure that when you come back, you have the right person to help you. Of course, I would say it in short phrases so the interpreter doesn't make any mistakes. And, um, and that way the person would go knowing that there was an issue that it was not an issue of the person itself or himself or herself, and that they will come back next time and there will be someone who will be able to help them. Thank you. That was a really, that was a really good answer. That was a really sensitive answer. I appreciate it. So folks, we are coming up on the close of our hour. So um, if you have any last questions, type quickly. Um, otherwise, we will go ahead and, and close. Um, I, for everyone that has provided their bar number in their registration email, um, we will submit your attendance to Washington State Bar Association. Um, if you did not provide that information in your registration, but you want to um, make sure that you get CLE credit, um, please email clinic at qlawfoundation.org so we can make sure that we get you your credit recorded. Um, I will send out a follow-up email um, that will have uh, one more link to Claudia's materials in PDF form. Um, and, um, and I have not seen anything new come in in the Q&A. So, um, so thank you all. Thank you, Claudia, for coming and for um, lending your wonderful expertise to this topic um, and, um, and teaching us so much. I feel, like, uh, I, I feel like my brain has grown a lot in the last hour. So. <laughs> Thank and so you we so are just... much. And you have my information in the presentation. If you have any questions that I didn't think about mentioning or if something comes up, do not hesitate. I would be happy to answer or look for the answer for you. Wonderful. Thank you so much.
And thank you all for being here and for um, asking such great questions and creating such a wonderful dialogue. Um, and uh, with that, we will go ahead and close. Thanks so much and everybody stay safe, wash your hands, and uh, we hope we get to see you in person soon. Thanks everyone. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.